We're going to pick back up in the sermon series Greg started last Sunday called Hope is Here. And in this series, we're just looking at different ways that, you know, Jesus can bring hope into our lives through the different things that we go through. And last week, Greg talked about the times in our life when we're burdened by different things or when we find ourselves weary just because of the way life can go sometimes. And how Jesus asks us to bring our burdens to Him, to bring that weariness to Him. And we talked about how we as a church, you know, that, that's part of who we are too. We're there to be that shoulder for somebody to lean on in a tough time and to help them through and be an encouragement to them. But you know, sometimes we need hope not just when we're weary. Sometimes we need hope when we're just at a point of complete brokenness in our lives. Um, this little guy's name on the screen is Isaiah. Isaiah has a condition called brittle bone disease. And uh, when Isaiah's mom, Vicki, gave birth to him, the doctors didn't even think that he would survive the experience. His bones were so fragile, uh, they thought it would kill him uh, in the process. But he did survive, and he obviously needed a lot of treatment after he was born. I mean, his, his bones would break just doing normal things, even sneezing. He would break bones doing that. And Vicki used to have to carry him around on a pillow when he was an infant because he required that much cushioning to kind of keep his body safe. You know, our lives are fragile. Our lives are fragile. And our lives can easily be broken. And a lot of times that results from choices and decisions that we make. Uh, you know, they have consequences. You know, we've all had times when we have chosen poorly. Times when we have missed the mark and we've fallen in to sin. And that usually has resulted in some kind of brokenness. Uh, maybe a relationship falls apart, or finances suffer, a job is lost, uh, a marriage is strained. You know, and it can leave us in those moments, in those moments of brokenness, can leave us feeling hopeless as we're kind of scrambling around trying to pick up the pieces, trying to put things back together. And maybe in those moments we feel like, well, God can never forgive me for this. I, I can never be forgiven. This can never be, uh, you know, looked over and it feels like everybody's just standing around you in judgment. And it's in those times of the brokenness like that that we need hope. There's a story <clears throat> of a woman in the scriptures who knew exactly what it felt like to be broken and to be exposed and to need that hope desperately. It takes place in John chapter 8. Jesus is traveling towards Jerusalem to teach in the temple. And as he's sitting there with the crowd teaching, it says that a, a, a mob kind of comes up and they're dragging a woman along with her. And that's what we're going to pick up uh, in John's gospel. It says, As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. So the, this woman is, is brought, in this story, is brought before everyone with the accusation that she had been caught in the very act of adultery. At least from what we can tell in the scripture, it's not just like, hey, they knew this about her or this was taking place in her life. It seems that these men apprehended her in the act, apprehended her in the, the activity itself. I mean, think about how humiliating that would be in this moment. This is what brokenness looks like. A broken marriage, a broken woman, a broken reputation, life possibly hanging in the balance because of a bad choice that she made. That This is rock bottom. What's even more shocking as you think about this story is that the Pharisees just seem to be using her as a pawn. You know, just let's just shame her. We're going to condemn her, but ultimately we just want to try to use her to get Jesus into trouble. Maybe he'll say something that people find offensive about the law of Moses. And we'll finally have something we can use against him. And get him arrested. Possibly get him killed. What would it have felt like to be this woman in this moment? This exposed. This publicly exposed of what you've done in front of everyone. I know this is going to sound weird at first. But our sins being exposed can be the worst and the best experience at the same time. On one hand, it's horrible because everybody knows the truth about you. 
But on the other hand, it can actually be a relief because finally, everybody knows the truth. There's no more hiding. There's no more playing games. There's no more justifying actions. There's no more rationalizing things that we really know to be wrong. Everything's out there in the open. It's exposed, for better or worse. So here she was, caught in the act of adultery, publicly humiliated and placed before Jesus. She probably thought at this point, my life has no chance. No chance. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and said, Let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. So rather than agree to this woman's death on account, of, on account of the law, Jesus does something different. He offers mercy in this moment. The Bible says that he stoops down and he begins to write in the sand. We're not told what he writes, but that's a question I'd like to ask in heaven one day. You know, what, what were you writing? Were you, you know, were you, was it something that was helping these, the crowd realize their own guilt before the law? You know, who knows? But when he's pressed by the mob for an answer, Jesus stands up and he tells them, Okay, proceed. Yeah, let's do this. But here's the catch. Let you who is without any sin, you can throw the first stone. You throw the first one. You know, as important as it is for the sinner to respond rightly to a bad choice that they have made, it's just as important that the church responds rightly in that moment as well. You know, there is no doubt we can receive hope in the midst of our brokenness when we, we admit that we have fallen short. Yes, I have sinned against God. That is essential. That's where it has to begin for every person. It has to begin in that frame of mind. But the beauty of the fellowship of the church is that we should have no fear of confessing our brokenness before others in the church. We should have no fear of being that open, that honest, that transparent, even as publicly as this woman's situation here. And that if we are honest with that, that we know we'll find forgiveness, we'll find mercy. Unfortunately, that has not always been the case with the church. It's not always been a place where people could be honest and transparent with the brokenness that they are in and the choices that they have made knowing that if I, if I do this, if I come forward and admit this, that I can have forgiveness, I can have mercy. It, unfortunately, it's, it's not always been that kind of place, but it should be. It should be. That's the goal we should have. Jesus is making a point here. He's teaching the Pharisees a lesson about mercy. And he's saying to them, look, if you find yourself right now and you can't throw a stone based on what I just said, it's because you know you're guilty of breaking the law at some point yourself. Now, Jesus is not saying, look, you can't make judgments or you can't discern between right and wrong. That's not what he's saying. He's calling out all they care about is bringing shame on this woman. All they care about is con condemning this woman and really using her as a pawn to try to get to him. They're just using this woman. And he's calling that out. As the dust settles, it's only the watching crowd, Jesus and the woman left. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. You know, throughout this woman's publicly uh, exposed situation here, brokenness, she must have felt, in this moment, must have felt hope for the very first time. Jesus is likely one of the very few in this crowd who didn't immediately condemn her for what she had done, but again, offered mercy in this moment. The truest thing about you is that God made you because He wants to love you. God made you because He wants to love you. God doesn't determine your value based on your performance. He doesn't determine your worth based on what you have or have not done in your past. He made you because He wants to love you. 
Your hope is found in a God whose love will always be there for you, no matter what you've done. But He loves you way too much to ignore your sin. He loves you way too much to ignore and just leave you in brokenness. Jesus clearly doesn't condone the woman's actions. He doesn't condone the sin. In fact, the last words he says to her are, Go and sin no more. Not meaning, look, I expect you to be sinless from here on out, but leave what you know you're doing. You know what you're doing right now is wrong. Leave that. Leave it. Jesus doesn't shrug at sin like it's no big deal. You read through the Gospels and look at his teaching. He identifies it. He calls it out. Jesus does care about how we live our lives. He does care about the decisions that we make because the decisions that we make can often lead us into brokenness and can often hurt others. Jesus does want to expose sin, but not for the same reasons that the Pharisees did. I've heard it put this way. <clears throat> God exposes sin not to shame us, but to change us. Not to shame us, but to change us. Again, the Pharisees were just interested in condemnation. It's all they cared about, and using this woman to try to get to Jesus. But Jesus exposes sin for a different reason. He wants to heal us. He wants to make us right with God again. He wants to take the broken pieces, and He wants to put them back together. The Apostle Paul put it this way, Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to Himself through Christ. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. We beg you, on behalf of Christ, come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to become sin for us so that we could be made right with God through faith in Christ. There's a preacher named Matt Chandler uh, preaches at a church in Texas, and he told a story about when he was a freshman in Bible college. And uh, he and some of his friends met a young single mother named Kim. And so they were just trying to just introduce her to Jesus and talk about their faith with her, introduce her to God. So they figured a good way to do that, kind of a laid-back way to do that, would be invite her to a Christian concert. So they took her to this concert there uh, where they attended college. And Matt said that after the band played, a preacher got up and he started to, to speak about sexual immorality. Not that that's wrong, but Matt said he just was angry. Just right out of the gate, just angry in the way... He was talking to people, almost like he was talking at people in the way he was doing it. And he said that he held out this red rose, and he threw it into the crowd, and he said, while I'm speaking, you just pass, everybody pass that around. Don't worry about being careful or gentle with it. Pass it around to as many people as you can, and I'll get you to bring that back up here in a little while. And so he, he kept on preaching again in just this angry tone about sexual immorality. And Matt said that he looked over at Kim, who was sitting right beside him, this young single mother who had a rough past, and she just had her head kind of hung in shame in that moment. And towards the end of the sermon, the preacher said, Hey, bring that rose back up to me. So whoever had it brought it back up out of the crowd and handed it to him. And it was a mess. It was a mess. It was broken. Half the petals were gone. And he held up the broken rose and he says, This is the result of sexual immorality. Who would want this? It's not worth anything. It's been handled by so many people. Who would want this? Who would buy this? And Matt said one of the biggest regrets of his life as he was sitting there, because everything in him as he was sitting beside Kim, he wanted to stand up and he wanted to yell back at this preacher, Jesus wants that rose. He paid a great price for it. That's what the gospel is about. That he who knew no sin became sin for us. He took our sin. And he hung on that cross. And he took the justice. 
He took the wrath and the condemnation that we should have gotten. So that we could be forgiven. Jesus wants the broken rose. Because all of us are the broken rose. So I've got good news for you today. If you find yourself right now, right in this moment today, in the midst of brokenness because of decisions that you've made, and maybe you feel like everybody's just standing around in judgment waiting to throw a stone. I've got good news. Hope is here. Jesus is here in this place right now. And he wants to give you hope. But you have to make a choice. And that choice is going to determine what you experience in the future. You can stay on the path you're on right now and you can, you can make no changes. And that path is only going to lead to more brokenness. Or you can confess your sins to God. You can receive forgiveness through placing your faith in Jesus Christ. And you can have a new life. Now, this new life is going to have the same sinful desires and temptations that have always been there. But you're going to have some wonderful gifts to help you overcome that. You're going to have the gift of the Holy Spirit living inside you to give you the desire to live for God. You're going to have the very words of God in Scripture to guide you. And you're going to have this imperfect church family. And you can help us make this place a place where people can come and be honest and transparent with the brokenness that they're in, knowing that they will receive mercy. And that they can have the same grace and forgiveness that you have experienced in Christ. You can help us make this place that kind of place. But you have to make a choice. And now is the time to do it if you need.